Hello. Hi, everybody. We recently had a comment from Mitch Stevens, who suggested we do a video on the peace and security issue. And he was responding to some of the comments in the Revelation video that went up just a few days ago. And I thought, yeah, that's great. Thanks, Mitch, because we've been thinking about doing one on peace and security for a while, but it seems like such a huge subject because you can't get into the peace and security issue without touching on a whole bunch of other things connected to Revelation, to Daniel, to Matthew. You're going all over the place, as the Watchtower <laughs> indeed habitually does. So thanks, Mitch, for giving us the incentive, pushing us the rest of the way to want to do it now. Because yes, it is, as Mitch pointed out, very much on the minds of Jehovah's Witnesses all the time as the sign you're looking for to trigger all the other stuff that will lead to Armageddon. So we'll talk more about what, what connections they make with it as we analyze mm -hmm. the issue going back, well, to the beginning, because they've been talking about peace and security as a connection to the Armageddon scenario since the days of Russell. But I thought first, for most of the people who will watch this video, most are connecting it to the pr pronouncements of the Watchtower over the last 40 to 30 years. So did you want to read the, the verse first? Please? Yeah, I, th I think it would be good to read the, the verse we single out if we're Jehovah's Witnesses. The familiar one. The familiar one. Sometimes we read around it a bit, but this is the thought we focus on. So that's 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. Whatever it is that they are saying, oh, sorry. Whenever it is that they are saying peace and security, then sudden destruction is to be instantly upon them, just as the pang of distress upon a pregnant woman, and they will by no means escape. So, in your mind as a Jehovah's Witness, who are the they? I don't think I ever asked the they, who that, that question. Who and are they? I was, would automatically think it has to do with, with uh, the governments, UN, uh, you know, the they're they're going to pronounce peace and security for the world and then we're going to know so it's going to be an official pronouncement on yeah. a worldwide basis by some huge organization like the UN specifically yeah. the UN in the way they picture it on the front of the watchtower sometimes mm. all right so i wanted to look at this set of comments by david reed we've talked about david reed before he did a series of excellent books for baker bookhouse back in the 1980s and 90s some of them are still available if you want to go onto his website. This one is Answering Jehovah's Witnesses. Came out in 1996, significantly just about the time they changed the generation teaching. Mm. This is his comment about peace and security and how the Watchtower takes this thought and runs with it back in the 1970s and 80s. David says, painfully conscious of the need to defend themselves against the charge of being false prophets due to the failure of Armageddon to occur by 1975, Watchtower leaders have used extra caution since then when making predictions. Nonetheless, they have continued to make such predictions. One technique they have employed is to say enough to convince Jehovah's Witnesses of the likelihood of Armageddon by a certain date without actually spelling it out in black and white. In this way, they inspire their followers to put extra time into their door-to-door -door work in a final home stretch effort without leaving an incriminating trail of failed prophetic quotes. <laughs> Thus Watchtower and Awake articles in October 1985 tied in the United Nations Proclamation of 1986 as an international year of peace with the biblical warning whenever it is that they are saying peace and security then sudden destruction is to be instantly upon them. And that of course is that verse that Vivian just read, 1 Thessalonians 5.3. Mm -hmm. The October 1 and 15 Watchtower magazine covers displayed photos of UN headquarters along with the bold headline, Peace and Security. Although unrecognizable to outsiders as a prophecy that 1986 would see the end of the world, the message came across loud and clear to JWs and sent them practically running from door to door to sound the final warning. Less than two years later, the April 8th, 1988 Awake magazine added to its prophecy of, quote, a peaceful and secure new world, 
before the generation that saw the events of 1914 passes away. That's page four. The authoritative statement that, quote, the Hebrews reckon 75 years as one generation. That's on page 14 of that April 8, 1988. Oh, wait, by the way, the, the month we were disfellowship. <laughs> Jehovah's Witness readers worldwide added 75 years to 1914 and come up with 1989 without coming right out and saying that 1989 would bring Armageddon, Awake concluded the discussion of 1914 and the 75 year generation by saying, quote, today most of the generation of 1914 has passed away. Jesus' words will come true. Mm -hmm. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. This is yet another reason for believing that Jehovah's thief-like day is imminent. End of quote. That's page 14. So it's worded again as if it's Jesus' words. Jesus' words will come Instead true. Instead of Watchtower words. Jesus' words have passed away now, according to the Watchtower understanding, right? Yeah, he gets the blame. So, David Reed says, although they avoided making another statement that could be quoted later as a false prophecy, Watchtower leaders still created in JW Minds great mm -hmm. expectations for the year 1989. We've addressed that in another video about Glasnost. We'll take that up mm -hmm. a little bit more in, in some quotes later in the video follow-up to this. The, these subtle predictions for 1986 and 1989 are cited here as evidence that the corporate false prophet has not repented. Mm. Because it is true that most of us think of the last significant date for a false prophecy being 1975. Yeah, yeah. So how did he get away with this mix and match approach to Bible prophecy? Well, part of it is I think they're learning. Like he says, they're learning not to leave a trail. So they, they do it more by conditioning your mind to uh, make certain assumptions when you see certain statements yeah. by them. Trigger words, trigger phrases, mm -hmm. trigger pictures. pictures. Yeah. Yeah, in their magazines, on the front of their magazines, now in vivid color, which mm -hmm. they didn't have back in Rother Russell and Rutherford's day. So you mix, you mix and match scriptures too and relate them to each other. Yeah, yeah. So we thought the first thing we should do in, in talking about peace and security is get away from the verse and get into the, the context. immediate context the, mm -hmm. the 11 verses around this verse mm -hmm. starting at chapter 5 verse 1 so we'll read down to verse 11 now as for the times and the seasons brothers you need nothing to be written to you for you yourselves know quite well that Jehovah's day is coming exactly as a thief in the night Whenever it is that they are saying peace and security, then suddenly destruction is to be instantly upon them, just as the pang of distress upon a pregnant woman, and they will by no means escape. But you, brothers, you are not in darkness, so that that day should overtake you as it would thieves. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We belong neither to night nor to darkness. So then, let us not sleep on as the rest do, but let us stay awake and keep our senses. For those who sleep are accustomed to sleep at night. Those who get drunk are usually drunk at night. But as for us who belong to the day, let us keep our senses and have on the breastplate of faith and have on, oh, sorry, and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation, because God assigned us not to wrath, but to the acquiring of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, that whether we stay awake or are asleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, keep comforting one another and building one another up, just as you are in fact doing. So a bunch of problems right away. One is times and seasons. Isn't yeah. this the very thing that Paul... In well, Acts 1-7. Paul's taking up an idea that's already been revealed by Christ to the apostles before Paul was converted mm -hmm. about that doesn't belong to you to know times and seasons. Yeah. So he's, he's saying, I don't have to write to you about that. 
You, you have no just, need. Yeah. And, and what does that mean for us today? Well, it obviously means that you don't need to know anything about a UN mm -hmm. or a world empire of false religion to understand this prophecy properly. Yeah. They already have instruction on this, and they're a young congregation. This is mm -hmm. not, therefore, advanced knowledge. So what's the basic message here? You but, yourselves yeah. are aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. That's yeah. not a new thought. Yeah, thieves don't drop you a note to tell you when they're coming. So you're not going to know the when. So I think even the translation of verse 4 is a problem. How did they render yeah. verse 4 again? It's strangely worded. It says, But you, brothers, you are not in darkness, so that the day should overtake you as it would thieves. Well, that's not the thought of the context, no. though, is it? But they do have in the footnote that it could be translated, overtake you as a thief. As a thief would overtake you. Yeah, So because, yeah. you know, it's not the thief that's in danger here. It's, that's right. It's us being caught. So the setup here is is for the for the analysis of who they is that will mm -hmm. be saying peace and security is there's only really three personages in this little yeah. analogy he's using yeah. right that's the the sleeper mm -hmm. the person who's not asleep yeah and the thief so the they are the sleepers the people who are just going along merrily saying peace and security their life is normal everything they're content they're happy and the contrast is the ones that are awake mm -hmm. they have belief they have faith they know the day of the Lord is going to come the second yeah. coming that, that's what it's about right in mm -hmm. verse 2 it's this is the day of the Lord this is not a sign that you will have to watch for mm -hmm. that the day of the Lord is coming yeah. this is the day of the Lord overtaking you yeah now they have translated it Jehovah's Day but it should be Lord's Day. Well, there's another problem that is not a minor problem. Yeah. Day of Jehovah in verse 2. Well, if you just look back to verse 17 and 18 in the, yeah. in the prior chapter, you realize the Lord here is Jesus Christ. 17 says, Afterward, we the living who are surviving will together with them be caught away in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. The Lord. We Christians will always be with the Lord. There's mm -hmm. the hope of the early Christians. And then again in verse 9 of chapter 5. God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain, obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, so Jesus Christ is attached to the Lord. So it's matters. a violation of context as well as Greek translation to do what they have done mm -hmm. with verse 2. Mm -hmm. So the suddenness of this, it's not a sudden announcement that the day of the Lord is coming because destruction of religion occurs. Yeah. It's not about Armageddon. So how is it that you have in your mind that all of this is tied to world empire false religion and the United Nations and a beast? And some great proclamation by them. Yeah. That is something that they have planted in your head and conditioned you yeah. to thinking about all the time whenever you hear the expression peace and security. You're not thinking about uh, relating it to uh, people having a kind of uh, casual attitude or a, a normal living normally and thinking everything's dandy, uh, you know, everything's peaceful. And most people on the planet are like that. They just they're pretty content with the way things are. If they've got a home and a job and a family, they're you know they're they're gonna say yeah. I'm, I'm, Hunky dory. I'm, I can yeah. sleep securely, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that's impossible to conceive of if if the religion has been destroyed, mm. and all the stuff that you remember from Jesus' sayings about that day being like the days of Noah. Everybody's doing everything normally, and then yeah. all of a sudden, all of a sudden, destruction comes. Mm. Men are being, <laughs> men and women are being given in marriage. Yeah, they're not, they're not awaiting the day of judgment from God. That's not in their uh, in their scenario at all. They're they're thinking life will go on the way it is. So, of course, this fits in the Watchtower's way of looking at the Second Coming, which is a long-term presence. Now, uh, well, from 1874 when they first said it began, mm -hmm. now 1914, it's already 105 years long. This second presence of the Lord Jesus. So it fits in with this idea that you'll only know He's present by a number of signs and apparently the last of those signs will be the fall of religion but 
this yeah. this really is a scary tribute to the power of propaganda and mind mm -hmm. control that you yeah. you automatically connect all these thoughts that are not in the context yeah in the passage there's nothing about signs of times you're actually told it's going to come like a thief you're not going to know they're not going to know the difference is that you're awake you're an alert believer yeah and in expectation always so you're always ready that's right so you're not you're not awake because of times and seasons and special signs yeah yeah so in the next segment we want to see how ray franz looks at this same passage and how he analyzes how the watchtower habitually gets away with this armageddon alarmism and jumping from here to Revelation 17, right? hum, making hum these kind of hermeneutics, yeah, yes. strange connections. That's in the next segment. Mm -hmm.